Welcome everyone. Uh, we are super happy that you decided to share with us this afternoon if you're in Europe or morning if you're from US or I don't know, evening if you're from India, whatever, probably all over. Um, my name is Susanna and I'm representing a co-host of this amazing webinar that we are going to have with Dan and Biontreat Food Association, which is Coalition of Health Professionals for Regenerative Agriculture. And we are a small nonprofit organization based in Europe. We kickstarted our work uh, last year because we saw a, a big need for civil servants and health professionals to start to engage in the conversation and now around nutrient density and regenerative agriculture in, in a broader sense. So our, mi our mission, we have two main uh, goals that we work with. Uh, first one is to raise awareness and provide education on the connection between soil health and human health and nutrient density and uh, regenerative agriculture to healthcare providers, especially nutritionists and medical doctors. And um, the importance, we see like a huge importance to see healthcare sector to start discussing um, what can be done with the current public health pandemics as, you know, lifestyle diseases which are causing diabetes type 2, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and other metabolic disorders. So we want to co-create a future in Europe, but also in broader, like, worldwide spectrum of regenerative healthcare, which is a healthcare that is focused on using food grown in a regenerative matter with a salt short supply chains. Um, and we as healthcare providers ourselves, we saw this huge need to start educating ourselves of what's going on below our soil, but we also see the need for, you know, agronomists and farmers to also understand how their activities are affecting human health. So we want to bring this education to broader public, to universities, schools, online courses, webinars, et cetera, et cetera. Every Friday, we run a small webinar, um, at, at like a journal club, we call it Peer to Peer, where we come together to discuss different studies around nutrient density and regenerative organic agriculture and One Health. So we invite all of you to check it out and maybe join in one of our webinars, but we also record them online and then we put in our YouTube. Um, this month, we are also running a Women in Agriculture Month and General Women Health Month, where we are dedicating our educational posts around women health and how it's connected with soil health. Um, so that has been some pretty powerful month for all of us, as all of our co-founders are females. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, all of our work is super co-creative. Um, that's why I guess all, we are also here today, co-creating something with our friends from US. Um, so I will make a small, you know, reach out if any of you see themselves as, as a potential stakeholder for us in Europe to start discussing and start bringing this education and share knowledge and collaborate or, and apply some for, for some projects together, please reach out. Um, as our second main goal is to create this European Union-based community around nutrient density, we see a lot of movement with pioneers as Dan and Biotrend Food Association and Rodale Institute and Grattan Institute and all Brazil Harvest really leading this, this movement, but we are still, in, still quite a, um, a lot to be done in Europe. So if there, we have any Europeans here, we also encourage you to get connected to us of this uh, movement. Uh, so that was a short uh, introduction of our coalition, and then I'll give a voice to Dan so he can also introduce his work if anybody's not yet familiar with what they are doing. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Senna. Good to uh, see you again. I remember meeting you, I think, in uh, at Rodale this, this past fall. That was great. Okay. Um, yeah, um, my name is Dan Kittredge. I'm the founder and executive director of the Biodistrate Food Association. Um, we are an educational organization whose mission is to increase quality in the food supply. And by quality, we're talking about um, flavor, aroma, nutritive value, health giving attribute. Um, we understand that there's a significant variation in nutrient levels in food, as in between this carrot and that carrot, or this these oats and those oats. Um, and um, those nutrient level variations, we think, connect to um, not only soil health and um, um, plant health and ecosystem function, uh, but but human health as well. And so uh, I work for now, uh, founded in 2010, um, initially was primarily educational work for growers, helping them understand how to work more well with the land. Um, 
for the past number of years, since I think 2016, 2017, we've been working on the research to identify those nutrient variations um, from, from an empirical standpoint, <clears throat> to connect those variations with management practices and soil health so we can more specifically support farmers in, in the in the you know the best tactics and strategies for improving function and also building the capacity to assess those nutrient levels um, through non-invasive flash of light sort of spectroscopy. Um, and um, even more recently have begun to do uh, human health trials with some of our crops that we're studying, um, specifically beef um, is the crop that we're working on doing our first sort of categorical nutrient definition with. Um, and, and so, yeah, looking at that whole chain between how you manage the soil, um, the land, the ecosystem, its overall system function, um, uh, farm viability, nutrient levels, flavor, aroma, human health, um, cultural health. We think that through focusing on this one thing, food being more nutritious, we have the leverage point to really help systemically address a lot of apparently intransigent existential or apparently existential uh, issues with climate and health and I would say culture more broadly consciousness and coherence. So um, very much looking forward to this to this Q and A conversation. Um, and I think we have a number of questions that have been submitted ahead of time that our, our co-hosts or panelists are going to be posing to me and hopefully we'll be having a, a dialogue and a, and a competition back and forth. But those attendees who would like to pose questions as well, please feel free to put them in the, in the Q&A and um, they'll be engaged in the conversation. All right. So I'll let you guys take it away. Well, maybe Perfect. let's... Uh, Reza, do you want to start? I have one question, uh, just following up what Dan said. I, I was not aware that the beef study was also including the human health side. So I thought you guys were analyzing uh, samples, soil, also um, fecal samples, right? Mm -hmm. um, but are you actually translating it into a, a trial, a randomized control trial, or something like this to, to investigate human health connection? Yeah, so our partner um, at, at Utah State University, Stefan van Bleet, who is also European, Dutchman, um, uh, who actually comes at this as a nutritionist, not as an agronomist, um, uh, has been doing trials with some of the beef samples with human humans, um, not long term like cancer in 10,000 people over 20 years, but um, <clears throat> here's some of the beef we think is the best, and we're going to ask you guys to eat it, and here's some of the beef we think is the worst, but we're going to ask you guys to eat it. And then we're going to test your urine and um, blood for inflammation markers and things like that, you know, within a couple of hours after consuming that meat. Um, so, yeah, beginning to draw those connections. Um, I think uh, Blue Blancour, if anybody's familiar with them from France, um, has done yeah. a bunch of really quite, um, I think, global leading studies for the last 20 years looking at how animals are fed, specifically animals, and then those animal products are fed to humans and the effects on human health based on what the animals were fed. Um, you, know, you still eat your bacon and your eggs and your cream and your coffee in the morning. It's just a question of what are those animals that provided the bacon and eggs and cream eat? Um, so yeah, <clears throat> but we are doing that um, with, the, with the beef project and hope to do that more. Um, there's certainly been other you know, Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic and other sort of fairly reputable um, nutrition health research institutions that are reaching out to us to collaborate um, on deeper things like cancer and autism um, and how we can connect reversing those those issues with nutrition. Amazing. And yeah, go ahead, Ine. Uh, it's interesting that you said that you see traction from uh, institutes that they come to you because that was my question like how do you collaborate with uh, universities or like uh, institutes to to bring this knowledge and to bring the science and um, do you also reach out to them do they reach out to you and do you see throughout the years a trend like uh, towards nutrient density and more interest towards that linking health with nutrient density human health soil health yeah, it's, you know, when we started in 2010, I mean, we basically helped to create the word nutrient density, at least as it's currently understood in this conversation. So there was no, <laughs> there was no conversation because there was no word. Um, mm -hmm. And I started off primarily with, with, with growers, um, as I said, but as the word has been 
building over time. And we began to do the research with the science and with the handheld spectrometer um, in the last few years that really has been very organically spreading. Um, so we, and we are as well are a fairly small nonprofit educational organization. We don't really have the staff to be doing a lot of outreach, have historically done very little. Um, it's been a very much of a sort of inbound, organic, word of mouth relationships. Um, somebody will come across what we're doing and say, wow, you should meet this person. I'll say, great, I'd love to meet them. Will you make an introduction? And then they make the introduction and that person, we start working with them and then they say, hey, you should talk to those people over there. So it's a, it really is a, it feels like very much like an organic process. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're in, in right now setting up some, or at least applying for some major EU grant um, research money on nutrition um, with a number of European partners. You know, Wageningen has been reaching out. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot, it, it, it's, it's quite impressive, the sort of this, the caliber of the partners that are reaching out to engage with what we're doing. Um, I think it's an idea whose time is is about to arrive. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I can, you can get really depressed about the um, state of, of human health broadly. Um, but, or you can say this is what it takes for people to step up and, and start making changes. So um, I feel like as we're looking at that sort of increased levels of chronic disease and things like that, there's a much greater willingness, interest, and desire to um, look at more systemic solutions. Um, so yeah, it feels it feels very it feels very uh, promising how it's all continuing to evolve. I'd say. Um, so when it comes to research, now the BFA has um proved nutrient variation across the food supply chain uh what do you think it's the next big research that we should get into yeah so our initial few years of research were you know just verifying what we thought was true but there was not a lot of literature about which was the the absolute variation of nutrient levels in crops between carrots between you know rice cucumbers apples whatever it is um and you know we've done i think about 30 more than 30 crops we've looked at at this point, um, all plants, so roots, leaves, fruits, and grains uh, from that sort of broad broad spectrum variation assessment and found quite quite significant 2x, 5x, 10x type level variations, not 2%, 5%, 10%. Um, and so, um, and also that, that those variations connected to management practices and soil health from the sort of regenerative <clears throat> agroecological, organic, permacultural, you know, perspective, it seems like the way you manage the land um, really is a foundationally key aspect in the nutrient levels of the crops. Um, so now the issue is to say, you know, okay, so this carrot has twice as much calcium as that carrot, and this spinach has five times as much iron as that spinach, but a carrot is much more than just calcium, and spinach is much more than just iron. So how do we, from an empirical sort of Western rational, you know, biochemical framework make statements like this carrot is in the 80th percentile, this carrot's in the 60th percentile, this carrot's in the 40th percentile, because uh, foundationally we think that, um, you know, it's not like this is nutrient dense, this is not nutrient dense. That sort of binary is not really how nature works. Everything is in a continuum. Your health is in a, is in a continuum. You're, you know, you're, you're not, able to be perhaps diagnosed with a disease, but you may be at a relatively low level of energy and functionality um, versus someone who's really quite vital and vibrant. Um, so there's a continuum of health, um, you can say of vitality, and we say there's a continuum of nutritional value of food as well. So we wanna be able to say, um, this steak is in the 90th percentile of what a steak could be, the steak is in the 50th percentile, this is in the 30th percentile. And to do that requires a much more comprehensive set of um, assessments than we've historically been doing. So we're engaging a process called metabolomics, which um, involves looking at many hundreds of compounds in different families of compounds. So it's enzymes and vitamins and um, lipids and proteins and amino acids and secondary metabolites and elements. Our thought is if we begin to characterize a broad spectrum of nutrients um, and we look for the patterns, we'll be able to see levels and ratios that correlate with overall system function being better and lower. Uh, and, and so, um, yeah, going from, yes, there is more calcium in some carrots and less than other carrots to this is a better carrot and this is a worse carrot is really where we're at now. Um, and that is a fairly significant hurdle. 
Um, it certainly does not seem to be done anywhere in the literature that we're yet aware of. Um, we're ballparking it at something along the lines of a million dollars a crop. So to do beef is a million dollars, to do wheat is a million dollars, to do peppers is a million dollars, et cetera. Um, and so that's a, you know, um, not insignificant challenge, but as we continue to have all these uh, allies showing up, universities and researchers and governmental agencies and companies beginning to say, hey, we're interested in this, then we can strategically say, okay, you five people are interested in almonds, let's start a project with almonds. You eight people are interested in oats, let's start a project with oats. And you got 10 grand, you got 20 grand, you got 50 grand. And we can begin to, through you know, a coalition strategy of collaboration, you know, crowdsource the resources necessary to begin to actually populate these data sets and come to these conclusions. So um, that foundationally, that's the next step is really to be able to say, you know, what is good, what is decent, what is bad. And then from there, ideally connect that to management practices so growers can understand what they should be doing that's most efficient and least expensive, as opposed to what the um, agronomist or, or product salesperson is recommending. Um, as well as begin to uh, calibrate next level instrumentation to those definitions. Um, you know, our sort of grand vision has always been that, you know, the consumer would be able to go to a grocery store or farmer's market and be able to see in real time with the flash of light, what the level of nutrients is in a crop. And you can't calibrate an instrument to nutrient density until you've defined nutrient density. So um, this, this meter we've got right here, I've got a, a version of it is our sort of you know, it's our second generation right now, um, fairly rudimentary instrument. It is calibrated to some of these antioxidants and polyphenol levels and things like that in certain crops. It is not calibrated to nutrient density because we don't know what nutrient density is. Um, and so um, it's a functioning proof of concept. Yes, it's possible to have a handheld flash of light spectrometer that can give you real-time readings on crops. Um, but if those readings are not calibrated to overall nutritional value, then what value are the readings? Um, so which crops are calibrated now and how is the uh, whole like meter uh, functioning at the moment? Uh, do you have new features? Uh, is this evolving? How is it going? Yeah, um, I, I think we've got calibrations for 10 crops released. Um, I don't remember them all off the top of my head, oats and wheat and zucchini squash and I think mustard greens and I think the carrots, I don't remember, there's about 10 different crops. Um, and some of them are calibrated for antioxidants and polyphenols and bricks and BQI, BQI being six different elements plus antioxidants and polyphenols. Some are calibrated just for polyphenols, some are calibrated just for, just for antioxidants. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is a very rudimentary instrument. It is something that we engineered um, in 2017. Um, a lot has evolved in technology since 2017. Um, and so while we've been working to calibrate this instrument over the past few years as part of our nutrient variation work, um, um, it sure looks like this is not, um, like there's no reason to stick with this hardware set because there's much better pieces of hardware out there that we can work to calibrate to. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I, at, at the point, our plan is not to proceed forward with this generation instrument um, because foundationally it's calibrated to nutrient variation. It's not calibrated to nutrient density. And so um, there are a number of actually very interesting um, prospects that have been coming to us about other instruments that are available and um, that could be used that are much more sophisticated that would cost the same amount to produce. Um, but then again, until they're calibrated to something meaningful, what's the value? Um, so I hope that's clear. Um, it's clear in my mind because I talk about it all the time. And I've got a scientific mind, but I think sometimes when I'm explaining it, it's not, <laughs> no, it's I don't quite hear the simple answer. So maybe if I didn't convey it well, please ask, ask again. I just wanted to follow up on it because I, I, I'm wondering how are you going to define what is actually the nutrient density? I guess if you will be looking at a carrot and you'll be looking from zero to one, how you are going to define what is the you know carrot that gets score one, which is like the most nutrient dense carrot as possible? Exactly. <laughs> um, um, our thought is if it does not connect to human health input benefit, if it does not connect to <laughs> flavor and aroma, and plant health as defined by pest and disease resistance and soil health, 
Um, if it does not connect to those things, it's the wrong definition. So um, our thought is, you know, um, there is a point where those things all connect, where plants that are vigorous and vibrant, with crops that are flavorful and aromatic, where food that it causes you to be healthier, um, where soil functions more well, there's a point where those things all overlap and it's a sort of a continuum around that. And so that's why when we're engaging the research, we're not just looking at the biochemistry of the crop itself. We're also um, assessing the soil. We're also looking at the management practices and fertility programs, um, looking at the microbiome you know, dynamics uh, and beginning to assess the human health components is because um, who were we to say, right? I mean, who are we to say? Um, we're, like I said, a small organization. It's through the partnerships of people coming together that have different resources and capacities. The medical community can say, yes, this caused people to be healthier. The agronomic community can say, yes, these plants were healthier. The chef community can say, these were these were more flavorful, um, et cetera. So integrating the wisdom of these different communities um, and overlaying that on the data, we think will be that iterative process, which brings us to that deeper sort of coherence and understanding. Um, but it hasn't been done yet. And our thought is um, it's original research. We, you know, we don't know what the answers are. Uh, we should engage openly and collaboratively. And the answer we have next year will hopefully be improved two years from then. And as opposed to sort of like a fixed, this is the answer, it would be an iterative evolving understanding based on um, based on the collective wisdom. So. Um, for for farmers, you mentioned the BRICS uh, measurement, so I think it's interesting to go through that as well, like because it's a more accessible uh, tool as well, especially for farmers to see and measure their crops. Is it a reliable um, measurement, or does it have any real like uh, science to to say that if you measure your crop, you can actually connect nutrient density to 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 the BRICS levels? Yeah. Um, again, remembering we don't know what nutritionicity is. <laughs> so we're all, it's all like, we just don't, I just start to emphasize that we don't know exactly, but with, um, it sure does seem like when your crops have higher BRICS readings, they have longer shelf life, they have better flavor, the plants are healthier, the soil is functioning more well. So it seems like BRICS is actually a very good stand-in for nutrient density. Mm -hmm. um, there is an, a, 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 entirely an insufficient level of, of science to back that up from the empirical standpoint, from the peer review published standpoint. There's immense amounts of anecdotal evidence from growers who say, look, when my BRICS levels get to this level, get to this point, all things are, are functioning well. And when they're low, things really aren't. So we have lots of real world evidence saying BRICS is a very, very valuable instrument. Um, I'm not aware of a lot of um, sort of peer review literature, which has even seriously looked at this question at all. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. And consumers also can use a refractometer, right? Um, you know, you can, it's, it's hard because we, you know, we're actually looking right now to see if we can get our hands on um, a, uh, an infrared refractometer that can be non invasive and give you a bricks reading with a flash of light, because we think that will be a, probably a really good stand in for the next generation by a nutrient meter. Um, so, um, you know, most refractometers, you have to squish the crop to get a drop of juice out of it to get the reading. Um, so you can't really do that in the grocery store. You can only do it after you purchase the crop. But yeah. in general, um, it, you know, that probably is it for those who have access to refractometers and want to begin to, you know, go here and go there and study and see where your better results are. I say that's probably a really good stand in for nutrient density. Yeah, whatever that is. One thing about the meter because uh, I find fascinating what you have created. And you talked about consumers and how they can get it in their hands. So my question is, now it's in kind of like a pilot form, I guess. And what is your vision seeing this in the market? How do you see it coming into the market? And how would you engage consumers and bring this knowledge and education to them because we understand what is nutrient variation, nutrient density, we see like a lot of studies, but how how do you see educating consumers in an easy way and holding the bionutrient meter and understanding it? Because I think that's also a challenge. How do we bring such a knowledge in a simple 
way that they can understand the impact they can have to their human health? Um, through the grassroots collective <laughs> process of mutual empowerment, I think, I mean, my experience has been that, you know, wherever I go around the world to support, talk about this, um, people get really excited about the concept of, wow, if I just had a meter like that, I, if, there was, if that was possible, I would want one. And I tell my friends and I get very excited about it. So um, I kind of, I call this a shiny object. I'm not sure if you guys, you know, have crows or, or ravens or whatever in Europe, but you know, those birds that will, you know, they'll see a little piece of tin foil in the, in the, in the hedgerow and they'll, and they'll just go and they'll peck at it and they'll bring it back to their nest. Like, I mean, you can think of a smartphone as a shiny object and you're always looking at it, staring at it. Um, you know, it's like this, this, the meter as a, as a thing to, to focus the, the concept of, oh my God, there's nutrient variation in food and it connects to my health and my children's health and the environment. And if I'm going to go buy food anyways, why don't I choose the food that's most nutritious? Um, if you've got a thing in your hand that can sort of, you know, encapsulate that concept and that aha, um, my, my, my sense is were there to be 10,000 or a hundred thousand or a million or 10 million of these instruments out there and available in the world, um, those who get it would have them and they'd use them and they'd tell their friends. Um, you know, our, our vision with the meter has been that we don't necessarily need to have one in the hand of every person. Um, I was speaking a lot about this last fall when we were seriously thinking about mass producing this, this meter. Um, was imagine there was, you know, uh, <clears throat> 10,000 of these meters out around the world. Um, there's 10,000 people who actually care about it and get it and buy one for $400 or whatever it costs. Imagine that there's 10 people of that 10,000 that live in, in Berlin uh, or I don't know, whatever, choose your city. Um, and they each go to a different point of purchase to get their food. You know, one goes to this grocery store, one goes to that farmer's market, one, you know, whatever the different points of purchase are. And then at that point of purchase, you spend an extra, extra 15 minutes. So you flash a light at all the potatoes options on the shelf, all the carrot options on the shelf, all the spinach options on the shelf. Um, and that data gets uploaded into the cloud so that you know everybody in Berlin every week has an updated answer about where the best food is. Um, so you don't need to have a lot of people having the meter. If you've got a few people willing to do a little bit extra work as a citizen scientist, as a community activist, um, to populate that data set. And then anybody who wants to can look at the app and see where to go. And so our thought is, if you get 2%, 5% shift in the market, all of a sudden everybody's going over here and buying all the carrots off the shelf and they're going over there and buying all the blueberries off the shelf, then you're gonna get this feedback loop with, 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 with consumers, with the, the, the retailers, with the farmers, and it's gonna be a virtuous circle. Um, so, <clears throat> Yeah, the, the the sense I have is that, you know, if we are in a place where we can put something out there that really we can stand behind empirically and say the science behind this is rock solid, um, um, it really works and it's relatively usable, um, that people are ready. So uh, that's strategically how we've been envisioning rolling this thing out. Between now and then, when we have it, um, you know, it's a little bit of a, of a harder project because you're dealing in the conceptual realm. Um, you know, in many cases, people are not so interested in being educated and spending a lot of time researching and studying and organizing. They're, they have busy lives. Um, they have a lot going on. And um, it really is about meeting them in a way where it's a viable thing they can do, which does not take a lot of extra energy and effort. So, um, but I mean, in the meantime, there's a lot of science to do. There's a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, I'm very concerned about this term nutrient density being something that begins to be co-opted by people who are looking to make money, but aren't necessarily looking to accomplish the deeper objectives. Um, I grew up in the organic world where the community, you know, before there was ever a standard, um, long before the U.S. government, at least here in the, in the States, took it over. Um, and after which point, it seems like the industrial, you know, profit center has weaken the standard. Um, I see that happening in the regenerative community. There's an impulse, a deep, very, you know, coherent impulse for systemic benefit that seems to be occurring. 
but there's also a lot of companies that are looking to make claims and and ride the coattails and not really necessarily have any do a lot of systemic benefit. So um, I think there's always that creative tension between the vision, the idea, the early adopters, the you know like the deeper intent and the economic um, incentive to to have knockoffs and to popularize it and use a lot of marketing and make claims um, that can't be verified. Um, and that are that are dishonest effectively. So, um, yeah, that's a that's a creative tension. Um, that I think if we don't have hard science to back this up, we're um, we're very vulnerable. And so, um, yeah, yeah, are... especially for us in the healthcare sector, if we can't prove that there's actually a benefit from consuming uh, more nutrient dense foods uh, into human health, that's like that worth nothing right we can't really talk to big players to big corporates to governments and uh more in federal or european level also um yeah. you were talking about educating yeah sorry no, 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 no. so we're gonna go back to the the bio, bio, biometer for the final note because i i have one of those um <laughs> And right now we are running some workshops in Amsterdam around, you know, human health and hormonal health, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, my approach to it is always talk about what people are really curious about, which is their own health, and then sneak in the education about, you know, nutrient variation and regenerative culture. And what you said that this is like kind of shiny object is it's, I, I definitely see it from the participant of the workshop because I, I talk about those topics and everybody's like, yeah, interesting, whatever. But then I, I, I say, hey, by the way, there is this thing. And then everybody, I can see how everybody just kind of like, you know, get the extra energy. Like, whoa, whoa, they get whoa. really excited. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't even have to work, but just <laughs> have it. And then I say, hey, this is related to this and that. And then we give them a map where can, they can find farmers who do, you know, minimal tillage, cover crops, intensive crop rotation. So it's almost like it doesn't even need to work in this particular, it almost can be like a, you know, just artifact of like, oh, the thing. Which is what it is. Yeah. Which is what it is. <laughs> it's what it is for now. And I mean, yeah. I, I, I yeah. did try to use it. It's not yet, I think it, it's, it's fun. And I also definitely think that there is such an amazing tool that you can use and, and showcase but but yeah, you, you need a bit of um, it, it needs to be a bit of like an event around it. You won't just do it in the supermarket, right? Because it's a bit too complicated. But I just wanted to follow up with also the as you said, like I think it's it's so true that right now the regenerative culture is started to be used as a terminology from big from big corporations, which are not going away from also the social elements of, for example, agroecology. That's why I think that's why we also, yeah, the regenerative culture becoming industry, which is very um, beneficial for a lot of people who do not maybe, you know, want to focus on social elements of, of the transition that has to happen. Um, yeah. But then in terms of, you know, I, when, I think we are all here also to empower farmers and see how can we um, make actually farmers to get paid the right price for the food that they are producing. And I think the, the big um, element of the whole puzzle is to see how can we use it for um, preventive healthcare and also incentive from insurance companies. And now we, you know, the USDA in in US giving some money around like this vertical supply chains for regenerative agriculture that delivers it directly as a medically tailored diet and mm -hmm. medically like food, food is medicine approach and a food pharmacy. So I was wondering just, sorry, Reza, if I'm kind of dropping. No, I can, I can add it up to you like uh, okay. as, a, I, as a healthcare movement. No, do your question and then I do it I'll do my question. because yeah, I don't want to you. interrupt your question. Sorry. Sorry, so, so I just wanted to ask is like, when we are looking for ways to, I guess, expand the, the hectares around the globe that are implementing these farming practices, and when we are slowly starting to see that also the human benefits, and I strongly recommend to listen to Kuhn's podcast from Investing in Regenerative Culture, who spoke with Stefan Akshi about the, the yeah. new study that they do with agroecology. Um, yeah, I wonder how can we, how can you use this notion to make insurance companies to send, in, incentivize this product? So the products do not have to, sorry, those foods do not have to become products, because I think that's also the challenge that we just have to commodify um food 
to put the brand and marketing to actually get, uh, you know, better money for the farmers in the whole supply chain. But how can we keep commodifying and how can we just use the amazing nutrients that we're just supposed to have directly from the soil or the animal? Yeah, well, I think <clears throat> um, for starters, you can start off with a, you know, a very high quality wheat and then you can process it into a, into a flour, into a bread, which is no longer of high quality. So just because the thing was produced well does not mean the product in the package is actually beneficial. And that's a big, big piece of this puzzle is the more, I mean, I think you said it right at the beginning, the short supply chains, you know, you know, I, I think Michael Pollan is one of our sort of famous food movement authors here in the States said something along the lines of, if your grandmother wouldn't recognize it, it's not food. Um, and I like to talk about there's junk and there's food. We talk about junk food, like, no, food is not junk. You know, we have to separate these two things. And so processed products in many cases may have had inherently good attributes to them, but when they come to you in the, at the, in the format that they're in, they have negative impacts on your body. And so, again, a really big issue with this nutrient density conversation as big corporates begin to get involved, um, the raw wheat might've been nice, but this product really does not have those health benefits for you. And so let's get really clear about that um, and, and separate and separate these pieces. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot to un unpack here. Um, I don't know. I don't think I answered your question. I, I can, I can add it up because when we were talking about educating consumers with the buy with the meter and stuff, yeah. it's great. And it's an ants work, no one by one and community and stuff. But the reality is that in general, uh, pop, the population is not eating vegetables. It's not eating fruits. We're not eating a lot of spinach or blueberries. And that's the whole problem, right? We are eating a lot of processed food. So yeah. um, what if the big corporations, so this is where our con questions get connected. How are they actually uh, influential? Because they also have a role. The, the reality is the majority of people are eating processed food. They are coming from these corporates and they are feeding a lot of people. I think it's very easy for us in Europe or uh, maybe in the US to talk about this, but I'm Brazilian. I just came back from Brazil. If you talk about public health or just general availability of food, it's very different. So we need Nestle, we need Danone, we need all of these corporations to, okay, they're still going to produce processed food, but they need to be better. They, they can't just be completely shit. If we have broad acre crops like wheat, corn, soy, yeah. oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> corn, yeah. corn it's soy, and, <laughs> and, and all of these broad acre crops, if they have better nutrient density, I wonder if we don't have also an impact on, on healthcare in general of people. Well, I think being able to track, if you're going to be talking about a certification, a label, uh, some sort of a marketing thing, um, there just has to be some honest, some real integrity to it. Um, and I'm beginning to sense some of those crosswinds here in the States of people wanting to jump on putting together a label without necessarily doing the work of backing it up with the science and the human health trials and things like that. Um, I think to the second half of Susanna's question about, you know, the, the um, insurance companies and, and medically tailored meals and, and um, food as medicine, uh, there, there is some pretty good work. I think um, Catherine Couch is the one I oftentimes refer people to who we had at our conference a couple of times, but also was on Kuhn's podcast um, talking about the work she's doing in California with, um, I think it's Kaiser Permanente and um, a number of uh, <clears throat> University of California sort of state um, um, uh, hospitals and effectively providing medically tailored meals to people for a month or six weeks after they leave the hospital um, and having dramatically improved health effects, among which is not going back to the hospital within that month. And um, we had the, the um, what we call Obamacare that, you know, was, was put in as sort of a, an improvement or an update to the, to the federal health care regulations here in the States. And as I understand it, one of those components was um, the hospitals get paid based on, you know, how often people return back to the hospital um, or how fast they return back to the hospital. So if people don't go back to the hospital soon, the hospitals get paid more. If they go back more often, they get paid less. And so there now is like a direct economic incentive for people not to go back to the hospital. Um, 
And that's what Catherine's been doing very successfully. Um, she's just doing organic. She's doing organic and whole. She's not focusing on nutrient density per se. She's just saying, use raw organic ingredients, cook real meals, provide people that food for weeks at a time. And you do see profoundly improved health effects, which decreases the cost of healthcare, which decreases the insurance company's exposure. Um, and so I think there are some pretty interesting models there where we can align the economic incentives of these large entities um, strategically. There's always the, the concept of, of legislation and regulations, governmental regulations. Um, I'm a bit cynical about um, how a small <laughs> grassroots movement can establish real good, honest regulations. I, I'm, I'm just I'm just doubtful about that. Um, I do think that economic drivers affect the world significantly. And so if we can if we can begin to develop some economic drivers that are that are aligned with integrity, um, I think that's going to help move things rapidly. Um, so again, if you know you got Danone and Nestle, and they're both producing a, a Cheerios product, of, you know, and we can go out and say, this one's better, that one's worse, and we can get that out into the world, then the one who's doing a worse job is going to want to try to have it be reported that there's a better next time. So I think the, 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 the grassroots sort of ability to confirm or deny the claims that are on PAC and an ecosystem of of shared information where that information can be conveyed to the to the community. Um, and you know, different brands will begin to develop reputations for superior quality. Um, and that's been the pitch that I've been making to companies for a long time now is I'm happy to work with on principle, you know, Monsanto, or I guess it's Bayer now. Um, I'm not opposed to them on principle. I'm if they're willing to work with us in collaboration in 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 understanding how to produce crops that are more nutritious and, you know, distributing products that are going to facilitate that globally, bring it on. If McDonald's wants to dramatically imp improve the nutritional value of their burger, they want to be able to make a claim about their burger being better than the, than the Burger King burger, let's work together. Um, you know, I think I'm, I'm waiting for that time when those big corporates are willing to take those kinds of steps. But in principle, um, there are many players in the ecosystem and saying that you're bad, we don't like you, we don't want to work with you is not a really, um, I don't think it's a pragmatic strategy. So, um, yeah. yeah. A They're lot part of the community. ecosystem. So we cannot like exclude them. So we need to work hand in hand. I, I fully agree. And, yeah. and talking, uh, talking about the ecosystem, I think like another aspect that you talked about, another player is the hospitals and healthcare. And that's something that we also advocate towards like healthcare professionals. And my question or like, basically when we talk about education, uh, we educate consumers, we educate farmers, but we also need to educate students, medical students, because then we talk about the healthcare system and the healthcare system is, is pretty broken. And we see that chronic diseases are impacting economically also the healthcare system. And now they're trying to find like different ways to address it. So um, my question is about how do you see uh, yourself and Binary Food Association being like the representative of like educating medical students about nutrient density and having and playing a role there? Because I, I heard that you had like interest from Wageningen, which is all related to food and agriculture. But what about health? Do you also receive any interest from more medical kind of uh, institutes, uh, universities, yeah. except for your interest? I mean, we have certainly you know begun to get more inbound from you know established medical research institutions. Mm -hmm. um, I think some people from Utrecht in the Netherlands, I think there's a, a university that's focusing more about nutrition there. I don't know the details, but there was a woman, uh, Eva, who was, I was in conversation with, and she was like, okay, mm -hmm. we're getting nice as far as agriculture is concerned. We're focusing on nutrition and, and human health. So um, yeah, it's a big conversation. I mean, what do they say? At least in the States, the average uh, doctor receives less than six hours of of training on nutrition as part of their six year medical school process. Um, I mean, it's just outrageous 
that that the system that we've got right now, I mean, it's it's not outrageous, it's just it's the way it is. The the economic incentive is, you know, for the product, for the medical device, for the pharmaceutical, uh, you know, that's where the that's where the profit is. And so then therefore those are the people that are have their finger on the scale of the education. And they're, you know, the doctor is a salesperson for for drugs and <laughs> and surgeries, right? I mean, that's basically the way the system works. And so um, how do you create a dynamic where that education is shifted for that for those people who in many cases, I think truly in their heart do want to help people get better, but are in a box where, it, where they don't have the knowledge and there's a lot of pressure um, and, and countervailing incentives. You know, you get nice vacations in the Bahamas, you know, <laughs> If you recommend, <laughs> if you prescribe enough of this product, right, that your salesperson will give you, will just happen to give you a trip to the Bahamas. So um, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Um, I personally don't feel like I'm qualified to speak with too much confidence or specificity about the medical community. Um, our, my hope is that the work we're doing with the science, um, um, you know, can be a nucleating structure around which the medical community can begin to coalesce and plug in. And those people with those skills and specialties can begin to share and, and, and communicate outwards. Um, no one of us has all the pieces of the puzzle, um, but if we can build a structure where people are empowered in a symbiotic fashion, um, all these different constituencies can coalesce. People that are concerned about human health, people that are concerned about environmental health, um, you know, all, all these different dynamics. We actually have common cause in this area, I think. Um, but it's a big social movement. We need to be coalescing. It's a big social movement. And I, I, like I say, bring on the cataclysm. The more environmental, you know, just, you know, stress we have, the more people are concerned, the more health stress we have, the more people are concerned. I think we as humans are, are we're supposed to be good at fight or flight, which means when problems are far away, we kind of ignore them. And when problems get close, we're really good at dealing with them. So it seems like the problems are getting pretty close now. And so it seems to me that that you know we have that we have all the answers we need. It's just a question of enough of us coming together to implement them. Um, and uh, but also funding it. Well, I mean, like I say, everybody has um, you know, I we talk about democracy and and empowerment and voting and things like that. And I'm sure you guys talk about it in Europe as well. You know, you vote here once every two years or once every four years, um, you know, for your elected representative. But if you eat food, which most people do, and you buy it with money, which most people do, you have power that you are using every day. And so um where you spend your dollar or your euro or your you know kroner or whatever it is your franc is is going to is going to is going to shift where things what gets fed and what does and what and what sort of um you know dries up on the vine and so um at some point if we don't take responsibility for how we spend our money um i don't know i don't know i don't i don't know i think um I agree, but also I think, as I uh, alluded before, it's also still a very elitist uh, conversation for us that we are educated and talking about it and have the cap capability to discuss and to criticize and to self-analyze your how I spend my money and to I know I want to buy from farmers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for the normal population, for the billions of people on this planet, um, we do need some scale. And that's why I was asking about the corporations and how can we work with them to reach a certain scale that uh, we need. We need some kind of urgency as well in order to move uh, regeneration in all aspects. Um, and so, for example, right now we are working with corporations um, that want to transition their supply chain. So they are becoming more regenerative. Of course, they are using this. Of course, we know there's a lot of uh, other uh, motives behind it. 
but it is something that it's moving forward. It is something that's paying farmers to actually do something on the ground. Um, and so, for example, premium prices that we're also discussing a lot with farmers, we're paying farmers for biodiversity, we're paying farmers for carbon sequestration, we're paying farmers um, for general uh, good management of the land. Um, can we also pay farmers for nutrient density, for producing more nutrient dense crops? What's your view on take on price premiums? And, and do, we, do you actually work with any corporation on this level? I think that the price premium for quality is going to be a much more potent driver for farmers um, than, the, than the ecosystem service payments, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. I think. My experience, I mean, I grew up on a farm. I've been farming most of my life um, um, and I got into this whole work by trying to figure out how to make a living farming and realizing that if my plants weren't healthy, I wasn't getting much yield and <laughs> I wasn't getting much yield. I wasn't making much income. And so I was like, if my plants aren't healthy, there's my problem. Um, and what I you know, ended up realizing was, um, you know, your cost of production goes down as the ecosystem health improves. Um, it literally costs you less to produce higher quality food. So um, now if you've got a situation where you've got privileged people that are willing to pay a premium and your cost of production is, is lower and your and your and your you know your what you're selling it for is higher, then you're then that's a really strong economic incentive. For me as a farmer, I maintained my prices at what was normal because I didn't want to charge a premium because I didn't I feel like you know. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't want to be charging. I, I, I'm making plenty of money with with whatever else is getting. I don't need to charge a premium. Um, so there's there's two points there. One is I do think that that the premium for quality will be a very powerful vector for inspiring the transition towards real systemic regeneration and system function um, yes. for farms, as opposed to regulations and certifications like did you do these three things? Therefore, we'll give you this much money. Um, you know, if you're if your yields go up and your cost of production goes down, you know, you're going to have much more profit at the end of the year per acre or per hectare than if you're getting $20 per ton of carbon, for instance. Like it's just a, it's a, it's a much larger economic incentive for the farmer. So that's one piece of it. Um, the other piece of it is how about everybody, not just the privileged few that have the resources to, you know, pay an extra amount. Um, you know, our thought is that there's a couple of different factors here. One is if you are engaging in, in, um, in you know, social movement organizing, community organizing, you know, think of, I'll just take a, a um, school system as an example. Um, you know, I'm not sure what it's like in Europe, but, you know, in the U.S., what is fed to children at schools is very often the commodity product, not, not a superior nutritional product. Right, it's the it's oftentimes nutritionally fairly poor, um, and we saw with COVID that a lot of people who were on you know who were eating meals that were paid for by the government, whether it was through welfare or through through the school system, they may have been getting sufficient calories, but in many cases they were getting insufficient nutrition, and in many cases they had a lot of these um, pre-existing conditions, the comorbidities that connected to the the various detrimental COVID experience. Some people got COVID and didn't get particularly sick. Some people got COVID and died. Um, there seemed to be a real nice correlation with COVID, with these pre-existing co conditions and that COVID effect. So oftentimes people that are underprivileged, you know, are, you know, maybe getting money, getting fed through some government scheme, um, at least in the West, as far as I'm aware, those government schemes are producing inferior, are providing inferior quality food. So I think there's an amazing opportunity to organize around that, for instance. Um, you know, can we organize around the food in our schools being of a certain caliber? That if the United States government is paying whatever hundred billion dollars a year for school meals, can there be a, a, a line in there which says the only food that the government will purchase for school meals has to be at a certain caliber? Um, that if we've got welfare, that people get, you know, certain people who don't have enough money can get, you know, food stamps can get, you know, money for free food, basically, or, or you know, a, a piece of plastic that'll give you free food. Um, can there be a standard there which says um, that the they can't buy soda or 
there's a certain caliber of food that you know can be provided or is only available. And I think there are opportunities through the governmental structures to accomplish that. And I welcome the engagement of people who want to work on those levels. Um, that's not where my energy is focused, but I know that some people are, and I say, great. Um, I think there's a wonderful story that can be told there um, about how, in many cases, the governmental programs are providing food that is causing a lot of these um, chronic diseases. Um, so I hope I addressed your point. I'm not sure if I did. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. <laughs> we still have questions that we didn't ask because we're just on the conversation and there's people that actually sent questions. I would like to um, yeah. answer them. So uh, we have an answer for, for people. So um, this one is coming from Jessica. Um, and she asked, do you think crops that tend to grow better in a more acidic pH soil can actually be grown in alkaline soil when addressing certain nutrients in the soil? How important is pH really? All right. Well, that's a shift of topic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> more of an agronomy question. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, pH um, is not static in the field sort of the way we're taught oftentimes about, about agronomy is that this field has a pH of 6.4. This field has a pH of 5.3. Um, if, you, if you take a pH you know, a meter and you stick it into the root zone of a healthy plant, you'll find that the pH goes up and down by as many as two points in a given 24 hour period. So pH is a following factor of biological activity. The microbes, raise and lower pH to solubilize different nutrients to you know make them available to the plant as part of that symbiotic ecosystem that is nature has evolved for you know hundreds of millions of years. And so um, the only possibility you have to have a a static pH soil is one where there's no life in a soil. And so um, if you're in that situation, your biggest issue is getting life back into the soil. Um, and in many cases, you will have mineral deficiencies, which when you address those mineral deficiencies will balance out the pH. So um, and that may be a complicated answer for people who are not down in the weeds, but the short answer um, for something like blueberries, which is considered to be a plant that likes a low pH soil, um, my understanding is it functions very well in a balanced pH soil. Um, it just can live in a low pH soil when other plants can't. So it can live in low pH, does not mean it prefers to live in low pH. It's like rice um, can live underwater, does not mean it prefers to live underwater, right? If you don't flood the rice field, the rice plants will be more productive. It just happens to be a really good way to do the weeding mm -hmm. because if you flood the field, the rice will stay alive and all the weeds will die. And then you don't have to do any weeding, which if you're in a hot tropical zone in the middle of the summer, you don't really want to be out all day and beating down sun doing some weeding. So I understand the rationale for flooding your rice field, but but um, just because some plants can do well in low pH does not mean okay can exist in, in low pH does not mean they can't do well in a balanced pH. Um, hope that answers it. Okay, I'll go to the next one. This one was um, sustainable wellness. How are animals part of the cycle of creating nutrient density? How are animals part of the cycle? Well, um, arthropods and earthworms are considered to be animals, not just cows and chickens. Um, so, I mean, how, I mean, the real question is, what is what's the environment that, um, you know, crops are able to produce high quality food in? And that's an environment where the biological system is functioning very well, which means, um, you've got a broad spectrum of species of bacteria and fungi and archaea and all kinds of other members of the soil food web, earthworms, et cetera. Um, and so there's a, I mean, there's a, it's only when the symbiotic ecosystem is functioning well that the crops are producing high quality, you know, food. Um, so, um, I mean, do you need to have animals running over the land, like, like chickens and cows to produce high quality crops? No. But if you understand that earthworms and arthropods are technically animals, um, you're gonna have a hard time producing high quality food without them in the ecosystem. Um, there's a, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I'll go through the next one uh, from Weston Rob. 
Uh, what is the thing that you are most interested in now that you don't often get to talk about? What, are, what, what is the thing that you're mo most interested in that you don't often get to talk about? <laughs> um, consciousness, <laughs> intention, um, love and sensitivity. And um, yeah, I think there's a really important role, whether it's in the cooking of the food or the eating of the food or the um, production of the food, which is the heart that you put into it. Um, and I think, um, it also is what gives meaning to life. <laughs> um, and, uh, you can follow all the technical, you know, add this much water and plow, plow that to the seeds and till on these days or whatever. Um, but my, my opinion is that if you, that the more compassion and sensitivity you do the thing you're doing with, um, the more well it happens because we're dealing with life. We're not dealing with the chemistry set. We're not dealing with, you know, copper ions and, and sulfur, you know, we're, we're dealing with, with coherence. We're dealing with harmonics. We're dealing with um, consciousness uh, when we're dealing with life. And I think that's really a lot of what it comes down to is that, is that um, sensitivity. And then when you get to that level of sensitivity, um, you don't need to, understand a lot of the logic because it's intuitive you're you're guided from within what to do um which i think is how indigenous cultures for millennia have done it right i mean this whole western rational scientific method thing started in the 1700s right i mean it's not particularly old and we have models of cultures living for tens of thousands of years in peace and harmony and great coherence you know, having very positive effects on the landscape, um, that we're not engaging these external scientific instruments. So um, I think we have a lot to learn from the, the cultures that have come before us. Um, I think there's a sort of presumed um, superiority of the Western rational mind and cultural framework. I think we can see <laughs> the effects on the ecosystem and culture of the Western rational <laughs> mind and framework. So if we're at all being honest and scientific about it, we can see this is this deeply flawed, uh, deeply flawed culture perspective. Um, there certainly is some value in it, but um, but I think we have a lot to learn from other cultures. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with that of intention and um, yeah, so. I have to talk about that, but don't often. Okay. <laughs> and how does the meter work? And what is nutrient density? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is love? <laughs> Difficult one, no? <laughs> we tend to uh, only look into science. Yeah. But you're right. There is so much more into it. And um, we're actually here because of like, uh, not science, but also because of love, because if we share the same passion, we say consciousness, yeah. tension. So that's what brings us here. Yeah. Not well, the scientific science. method is just a cause and effect process of like trying yeah. to see what happens, which the science of the East is all about, you know, the chakras and the nadis and the meridians. And I mean, the scientific method can be applied to consciousness as well, not just the physical form. I mean, the scientific method is a beautiful thing. But the question is, how are we focusing it? I think. Mm. Um, I mean, I love the scientific method, but I think let's use it. <laughs> <laughs> Understand its role. Like, what are we doing? What are we? Are we just trying to profit and control? Are we using that scientific method to profit and control, or to facilitate deeper empowerment? Um, what's our true objective? Yeah. Um, we have two more questions, Susanna. Do you want to ask? We also had some other questions in the chat that people who are actually here post. So maybe I will prioritize those. Um, first one is asked by Frank. Uh, can you discuss the role of nutrient mineral balancing in the soil as described by William Albrecht? Albrecht. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Albrecht um, was one of those, you know, technically he was a proper Western rational scientist, agronomist. He ran the University of um, Missouri um, Soil Department for 20 years, um, a, a USDA Lang Grant University, um, had his PhD in agronomy, um, um, over 500 published papers, 
but did a lot of really interesting work looking at mineral levels and ratios in soil and the health of the animals that ate the crops that grew in those different soils. So for instance, um, you know, he would take one soil that had, you know, a little bit of calcium, a lot of magnesium, a lot of potassium and grow grain in it and feed it to chickens. And then another soil had a lot of, a lot of calciums, some magnesium and a little bit of potassium and, and grow grain and feed that to chickens and see, or rabbits or rats and, and see how those animals performed over multiple generations. And he was able to see some very powerful multi-generational effects on the animals based on what the minerals were in the soil that their food grew in. So I, I can call him really a spiritual forebear of this broader nutrient density conversation, um, you know, looking at the, the animal health impact based on what the dynamics were that the food they ate grew in. Um, so when I teach my two-day courses, um, I generally have an hour, hour and a half section where I talk about mineral balancing and I teach the Albrecht method. Um, you know, he was working in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. So this is not new information, um, but I think there's a lot of, a lot of value to it. Um, so yeah, I'm a fan of Albrecht. I think as far as, you know, university system, um, you know, if you're in Europe, Wangeningen or, or whoever it is where you're going to, in many cases, they'll recommend a nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus um, fertility program, which is a byproduct of World War II, you know, armaments industry and profit. It's not a byproduct of deeply studying animal health from the nature of the soil. Um, so yeah, as a, if you're gonna be taking a soil test and making recommendations based on that soil test, understand the intention or the history of that soil test. So in many cases, what the universities are recommending comes from a, 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 a paradigm that is a soluble nutrient input chemistry, abiotic. Um, it's not a symbiotic microbial, microbial you know, dynamic. So yeah, the Albrecht model, I think is, a, is, a, is one of the better ones out there for soil testing. There are other ones that are you know, more recent, but um, uh, valuable work, a valuable, you know, um, you know, scientific, you know, stone we can stand on as far as, you know, where does this information come from? And, and um, yeah, a fan, a fan of Bill. <laughs> okay, I guess we all have, I wrote it down, we all have homework to do after this webinar. Um, <laughs> the next question from Q&A, uh, well, actually, Daniela, uh, she asked three different questions. First one is, what about bare soil and nutrient density? Is there any data? And also, could farmers use the bio, biometer uh, to check the nutrient integrity of their crops uh, in terms of lacking the minerals? Mm -hmm. um, well, should the biometry meter work like we'd like it to, they certainly could test their crops. Um, and that's where we intend to go, is to give the grower the ability to flash a light at the plant while it's growing and be able to determine how well it's doing. And then we can make recommendations about how to ameliorate imbalances. Um, so the concept is, you know, you've got a instrument in your hand that you can use for real-time assessment. You don't have to send things off to a lab. And um, if we have some metadata about your soil type or what the variety was you planted or what the climate's been like for the last, you know, two months, or what your management practices have been, the more metadata you've got, you can take that flash of light and you can convert it into a recommendation um, to build as much function as possible for as little cost and as naturally as possible. So that certainly is part of the, the end game objective. Um, bare soil, um, you know, again, I can hide behind the, the answer. We don't know what nutrient density is, so we can't calibrate anything to nutrient density because we don't have it defined yet. But you know, in general, if we say it's overall system function, um, you know, I've got a rule on my farm is I don't want to see my soil more than two weeks of the year. Um, you know, if you look into nature, you don't see bare soil except where nature is doing not so well. And so um, if nature is our model, and that's, I guess, one of my dogmatic positions is nature figured all this stuff out a long time ago. And um, it would be wise for us to you know, learn the language of nature as opposed to thinking that we can impose something else on 
this environment and think we're going to be superior. So nature does not do monocultures. Nature does not do bare soil. Nature does not do, you know, big piles of compost, actually. <laughs> you know, she does not do uh, tillage. You know, there's a, there's a bunch of things that we engage in as, as, as farmers that are effectively not what nature does. And so we should be thinking about that. Um, foundationally, it's the it's the cover on the soil, which is the food for the soil life. And the soil life are those who feed the plant. So I'd like to say, you know, here in Massachusetts in the wintertime, there's no green leaves in the garden. Everything's brown. And the microbes, which are the bottom of the food chain, are not being fed through photosynthesis because there's no green leaves. And they did not fly to Florida for vacation for the winter. So how are they eating? You know, what are the microbes eating when there's no photosynthetic activity going on, they're eating that dead plant material. And so um, if we understand that keeping the bottom of the food chain functioning and flourishing is foundational for the middle of the food chain and top of the food chain, then starving the bottom of the food chain to death by having bare soil is a bad strategy. So this is why cover crops and mulch are really, really good strategies um, from a farming, from an agronomic perspective. Um, if there's a time when you're transitioning from one crop to the next and you need to do that, it's going to take you a week or two or something like that, a couple of days, that's part of the process. But overall, you want to try to maximize the amount of time where you've got cover in the soil, green or brown. Um, those were two of the questions. I think I forgot the third. Yeah, it, well, I actually will fit in one question as well from myself. Um, because you're a farmer and you spoke also with hundreds of farmers, I can imagine, in your life. And you know, all of us uh, from the coalition, we're all nutritionists. And but I always like to say that we are actually not nutritionists because we don't create nutrients, right? The nutrients is being created by Mother Earth, uh, by soil and microorganisms, and seed and water and photosynthesis and the energy and a labor of a farmer. So I'm wondering if, if first and foremost, if farmers are recognizing that they are the primary caregivers for the society, and what can we also do in the society to um, kind of pay tribute to the farmers and pay tribute to you know their work as the work on the shoulders of the rest of the society. I have this friend that is also a farmer and she says, you know, you go to a lawyer and once five, for five years and you pay like 500, five, 5,000 euros and then you, you pay for the services of a farmer every day, but we, we just don't tend to value the services that we receive every day. Yeah, so that's my question. I'm not sure what the question is exactly, but uh, are the farmers... <laughs> How do we, how do we, do farmers understand their role in healthcare and how do we um, acknowledge them for that? Yes. Um, I would say that a lot of farmers, I mean, if I was to talk about like the, the, the general farmer in America, whatever that is, of all the conferences I've been to and trade associations and things like that there are, I would say that farmers generally are pretty disassociated from their relationship to healthcare that there is not a connection made between food and health. That they're, you know, they feel very good about keeping the world fed, feeding the planet. They feel very proud about the fact that they are feeding the planet, which I think is debatable. I think 70% of the world's population is fed by producers that are operating under, under 25 acres. 70% of the world's population is fed by people producing at under 25 acres, right? The vast majority of the people on the planet are not eating the products from big mega farms and, and commodities that are shipped around the planet, right? The vast majority of the world's people are eating food from smallholders, from agroecologists, from, um, and that's just UN stats. Those are simple facts. So while the farmers here, the big farmers, quote unquote, think they're feeding the world, they're actually not. Um, they're, feeding, they're feeding the industrial supply chain and they've got the good marketing to make them feel good about it. I don't think there's much of a connection between um, that and health. There is a connection between farmers, you know, <laughs> in many cases, knowing that what they produce, they won't eat. Like they'll have a garden where they grow the food for their families and they got the stuff that they ship off down the, down the, <laughs> down the river. But enough farmers know what they're putting onto the field that they know they don't want to give it to their kids. So there is that sort of that truth in there. I don't think people really understand that the quality of the food affects your overall health so significantly. Um, I, I think that still is a connection that's not made. Um, how would you compensate farmers for, um, for, for producing foods of high caliber? Um, 
you know, foundationally money is a powerful force. And so if we can create a dynamic where farmers are paid more well for producing crops that are better, um, you know, I think that'll go a long way to affecting a lot of producers, which is which is foundational to our whole strategy with the biodiversity meter is like, let's establish a dynamic where the consumer can choose the thing that's best for themselves and their family. The retailer can make decisions about what they put on the shelf. The, the buyer, the packager can choose, you know, what's where they're getting things from. The agronomist can support the producer. The producer can see the quality of what they're producing. Let's bring transparency to this whole supply chain of food uh, and have instrumentation, real-time readings from instrumentation be um, the vector through which that can be accomplished. I think if we can, if we can do that, we can align the economic self-interest with the ecological self-interest, with the health self-interest. Um, and I would argue the consciousness self-interest because I do truly believe that, you know, if you eat junk, you vibrate less harmoniously and you have a harder time tuning into your higher nature. And okay. if you eat well, you vibrate more coherently and <laughs> you have more energy to be of service to the greater good. Um, so I don't think it's just about you know, physical health, I think it's spiritual and emotional and cultural health are all, all part and parcel of this food quality conversation. But who pays for, for higher uh, nutrient dense uh, food? Is it the consumer? Is it the uh, government? Um, who should be involved in, in, in paying for this? Well, if you think about short supply chains, you know, I mean, what is it the average farmer, the retail dollar, you know, I think it's something like 6%. So for every dollar that the consumer spends at a grocery store for food, 6% of that went to the farmer. Um, so there's a big space there. If you if you get the, the, the long supply chain out of it and people start eating real food to have farmers paid a premium much more than they're already getting, they're currently getting, and for the consumers to pay much less or the governmental agency that's that's providing the food for the school lunches. Um, I really do think a lot of the problem is in the middle of the supply chain where the major profits are. You know, if you take corn and turn it into something that resembles corn, great. You take corn and rip it into all its component parts and you've got corn sugar over here and corn oil over there. And, you know, these are all parts of an industrial process. That's where you're producing the junk. That's where the cost per calorie is going up. That's where the you know the the profit is for the big corporation. But I think I mean, I, um, I'm happy to work with companies, but I mean, if we're thinking about the systemic benefit for everybody involved, um, you know, creating a dynamic where the shorter the shorter the supply chain, the lower the level of processing, um, we can have both farmers paid more well and people have to pay less. Um, but it does go directly counter to the profit um, incentive of food industry. Um, I had also a question related to farmers. Um, when you, because you have been talking to growers uh, since 2010, from what I understood, have you noticed like a, a division of like or types of farmers that you talk to like more conventional farmers more organic farmers regenerative uh farmers who do you see they're more attracted or open to talk to about nutrient density and do you have a rough percentage of who are the growers and farmers yeah to? um well the term regenerative didn't exist five years ago in any meaningful yeah. way. So, you know, it's like all these fads where, you know, there's a word that comes in and then everybody jumps on the bandwagon and then it's like, oh, actually it's not quite good. And then there's a new word that comes in. So um, I would say it's hard because um, it seems like the people that come to hear me speak already have a certain perspective. They already are open to a certain degree I'm not invited to go speak at the conferences where the sort of the conventional mindset is. I'm oftentimes invited to go speak at the conferences where the more progressive mindset is. And so I have a pretty biased perspective because I go where invited and um, there's only certain kind of people who invite me to speak. <laughs> um, there certainly are people that are 
growing at very large scales. I mean, I was just in, in Saskatchewan in Western Canada uh, three weeks ago and had dinner with a farmer who had 12,000 acres and one side of the table and this neighbor only had 2,000 acres over here and at the, at the table. And, you know, the average size of the farm was in that many thousand acre size. Um, most of them were not organic. Um, I think maybe just a couple of the people in the entire conference were certified organic. Um, um, but, you know, this was an organization that is pushing that sort of agroecological, regenerative sort of context. And, and those were the speakers that were in attendance and, and, the, and then that drew the certain um, audience. So there are a lot of large scale farmers who are not certified organic, will never be certified organic, who are very interested in all this um, because it's they're seeing it work on the neighbor's farms. They're hearing about it. Um, they're struggling with environmental climate issues, um, you know, droughts and floods and things like that. And they're having a hard time making ends meet, um, except when they work more well with nature. So it's kind of exciting. You know, you look at the environmental imbalances and it's driving everyone towards these biological system solutions because they're the only way to really get things to work. Um, um, when you're managing your land in a very detrimental way, crops don't do so well. When you're managing your land in a more beneficial way, crops do better regardless of the climate dynamics. One of the biggest countervailing forces as it pertains to that is the, is the, the farm bill here in the States where you know the government pays you for your crop, whether you produce it or not. So it doesn't really matter if you lose everything to flood or to lose everything to drought because you're still gonna get paid. Um, and you know, a lot of the farmers are in the sort of the right wing Republican sort of side of the political equation, the bigger ones, and they're very much down on welfare and people not having to work for money for their food and you know the social safety net. And I'm like, this is welfare buddies. The government is paying you regardless of what you do. You can fail at your crop production and you're still getting paid. Like that's welfare. You got a problem with it, you're getting it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of different dynamics in place, but I, I, I would say there's a lot of interest in large scale conventional, what would have been conventional kind of minded people now that was not present even five years ago. So very heartening, I would say. Yeah. Definitely see this a lot in the field as well. When talking to farmers, they're really interested. We just need to help them to get there uh, with, uh, well, normally they want to do it, but they don't know how to do it or they can't afford to do it. So yeah. it's a whole um, process that needs to be taking place in, towards uh, transitioning. I think we need to go to this last two questions and then we we have our time uh, finishing. So this is from Ricky Stephens. He says, Dan, do you think there's a future where we pay for food based on dollars per unit of nutrient density? And if so, how far away do you believe the future is? And what are the milestones that need to happen to get there? In the five minutes remaining. <laughs> I'll still <laughs> leaving space for the last question. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I do think that there is a future where um, people will be paying, they'll be choosing their food based on its inherent nutritional value, and there will be economic bifurcations based on that. Um, the biggest issue to address right now is to empirically define what that nutritional value is, to define nutrient density until we have a solid, open, scientific standard and set of defined continuum. Um, we're never going to be able to get to that point. Um, once that's done, I think the instrumentation um, and labels and certification systems will come along fairly readily. Um, as I said before, my concern is that certification systems and labeling will begin to occur that's not based on that empiricism. And then this whole literature density conversation get, get totally sideswiped. Um, um, how long will it take? Um, I think it's more of a question of money than time. Um, I think. The resources to do the work are significant. The resources we need to do the work are significant. Um, and that's been our issue historically is co coalescing and coordinating that. Um, if I said earlier that it's gonna be a million dollars a crop to define nutrient density and we're doing one crop a year, you know, okay, 20, <laughs> 2073, we're done. Um, if we do five crops a year, you know, then 2033, we're done. If we do 25 crops a year, 2025, we're done. Um, 
you know, how do we raise the money to do the work to define the, the thing so that we can then build the structure around it? Um, I would say it's more a question of resource availability than it is time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and the last one, it's from Melissa Holman. I hope I said this right. Uh, do you think the world should be fed by even more farms under 25 acres or just shifting the larger farms to regenerative practices, but staying large? Are there enough people to farm if it's the smaller farms that should continue to feed us? What do I think should happen? Um, yeah. I think people should not be living in cities to the, anywhere near the degree they are. I think we are actually animals. We belong in nature, in culture and community. We should not be wage slaves, you know, working for money, paying for, you know, rent and services. I think we, you know, we have models of cultural vitality and vibrance and coherence and depth um, <clears throat> where we lived much more closely with nature. I think we're we're in a very perverse cultural context. And absolutely, I think um, smallholders caretakers um, um, of smaller acreage is is what I think should happen. Absolutely. I think that there's um, you know plenty of people in the world and plenty of people who probably don't want to be in debt and struggling and stressed out all the time. And at the bottom of the economic paradigm, I think land tenure, land reform, um, land access, uh, these are all very, very important pieces of the puzzle. Um, you know, the traditional communities here in North America say that we belong to the land, the land does not belong to us. So there's going to have to be some, I mean, what I think should happen would involve a bunch of, of deeper shifts of understanding and thought and cultural structure, which I don't know how long that'll take. Um, but yeah, I would advocate for um, a culture that is much closer to the land and community and simpler. Um, and I think that would be better for many other for many, in many ways, um, yeah. Perfect, we have one minute left. So this was very successful, we managed. <laughs> <laughs> um, just wanna thank everybody then for participating. Thank you so much to you then and to the Bionutrient Food Association. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out to us, uh, we are the Coalition of Health Professionals for Regenerative Agriculture. We are on LinkedIn, on Instagram. You can find us on our website as well. Uh, please get in contact and we'll see you um, soon <laughs> in another Great. appointment. <laughs> thank you so much then. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone.